Listen up, people. You're headed for a climate disaster. And yet every year, governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, so here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Welcome to the third event of the year in the One UN Diverse Talent Series of career webinar events. First of all, many thanks to United Nations Volunteers for hosting this event today. Uh, we are very grateful. And many thanks to colleagues around the globe from over 20 United Nations agencies who are here to come together to make this happen today. My name is Mehmet Korkmaz. I work with the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, in Rome, Italy, for the Learning and Performance Branch in the Human Resources Division. And it is really my great pleasure to be with you today and moderate this panel discussion and a Q&A session which will be focusing on today's theme, which is Environment and Climate Change Careers in the UN. So just a few words about the Food and Agriculture Organization, which I am representing today. FAO is a specialized agency of the United Nations that leads international efforts to defeat hunger. And our goal is to achieve food security for all and make sure that people have regular access to enough high quality food to lead active, healthy lives. This is strictly entwined to environment and climate change and we are really, really happy to be part of this initiative today. So today's event is a series of our most insightful and inspiring joint events under the One UN umbrella, bringing together more than 20 organizations for talent outreach. So the smooth and efficient coordination and collaboration between the UN and the UN system entities is really essential to achieve the global sustainable development goals. So there are many different UN organizations and agencies with different talent needs and expertise needs. And in fact, we have colleagues today in the background from different agencies to support with the questions which you can pose in the chat box today. And uh, yeah, once again, for, uh, uh, thank you so much for your support and engagement colleagues for uh, supporting with the questions. So for you all here in the audience today, um, this session offers an exciting opportunity to learn more about the work of the United Nations Common System on environment and climate change from a panel of industry experts around the globe. And please also stay tuned because at the end of the session today, we have a handout with useful information on accessing the various job application portals of the One UN participating organizations. And uh, a quick note on diversity and inclusion, which is very dear to my heart. The United Nations is committed to creating a diverse and inclusive environment of mutual respect. The United Nations recruits and employ staff regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, race, religious, cultural and ethnic backgrounds or disabilities. So we are looking for candidates who are passionate about making a difference in the world and we'd love for you to join us in doing so as well. And today's theme now, really more than ever, we need to act on problems caused by environmental degradation, climate change, biodiversity loss, waste and pollution. This affects all lives and livelihoods globally, rich and poor. Each of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals contribute to these directly or indirectly. In fact, the background I chose today is the shade of green, which represents the Sustainable Development Goal number 13 for climate action. 
So we in the larger UN family are tackling these problems from the grassroots levels to international policy alongside our partners. And all UN entities have colleagues and units dedicated to working on solutions. And in fact, we have now three of them with us today. Please allow me now to introduce the panelists and learn a bit more about them. First, we have Karen Smith. She is the team lead in the Intergovernmental Support and Collective Progress Division of UN Climate Change, UNFCCC. She's currently based in Bonn, Germany. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Annette. Hi. Yeah, next we have Doreen Lynn Robinson. She's the head of biodiversity and land branch in UN Environment Programs Ecosystems Division. She's currently based in Nairobi, Kenya. A warm welcome, Doreen. Hello. Hi. And our third panelist is Muyeye Chambwera. He is a leader in climate change and sustainable development. He is currently with UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, based in Addis Abeba, Ethiopia. Warm welcome to you as well, Muyeye. Thanks for joining. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, thank you. So just before starting the, this panel discussion, I would like to once again warmly welcome our participants today. We will have two parts uh, in today's session. So one, we will have the panel discussion where some questions will be asked to all three panelists to hear more about their background and also hear some tips and advice they may have for you related to a career in the environment and climate change field. And then for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, we will take some questions which will be channeled through the uh, chat box. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We will try to answer as many as possible. Okay. So let's jump into our panel discussion. Um, so my first question is, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your professional background before and after joining the UN? What kind of work do you do now and how does it fit within the larger UN system? So um, shall we start with you, Karen? Sure. Thanks, Mamet. Okay, over to you. Good day to all listening. Happy to be a part of this initiative. I am a national of Barbados, and I started my career as a civil servant in the government of Barbados. I was in secondary school in the early 90s. Yeah, that dates me. Uh, when environmental issues were taking center stage. And in 1994, Barbados hosted the SITS conference, which I attended as a youth delegate. And that's where my interest in pursuing a career in the environmental field began. So I did my bachelor's in biology with a focus on ecology courses, and I did a master's in environmental management. And then I went back to Barbados, and in a few months, I got my dream job working in the Ministry of Environment. Yes, actually working in a job where I could utilize what I had studied. And I worked there for nine years in various roles, but primarily focused on national implementation of multilateral environmental treaties. So it was like the national focal point for the Convention on Desertification, the Montreal Protocol, and the Climate Change Convention. And it was my participation in that UNFCCC process as a delegate that led me to work in here in Bonn at the Secretariat. But we can talk later about how I moved to the UNFCCC, mm -hmm. but I started here in 2009, and I am now team lead, as you mentioned, in the Intergovernmental Support and Collective Progress Division. You ask, how do we fit into the larger UN system? So let me first stress that the Secretariat is not an implementing agency. That is, we are not directly engaged with climate change implementation at the national level. Rather, our role is to support the intergovernmental negotiations on climate change. And my role in the, in the intergovernmental support subdivision is central to the core mandate of the Secretariat. Those of you familiar with the UNFCCC process would associate us with the convening of the annual meetings known as COPs, Conference of the Parties. And our COPs are the largest annual UN conference, usually attended on average by about 25,000 participants. So I and my team are directly in charge of supporting that COP process. And as you can imagine, we are currently super busy, 
with the preparations for the upcoming COP27, which is gonna be in Sharm el Sheikh this year in Egypt in November. Climate change is often described as the existential threat of our time, and there are several UN agencies that have a role in addressing this challenge, like my colleagues here today, but it is indeed exciting to be working at the organization tasked with the responsibility of facilitating the multilateral effort of finding a solution. Thanks, Mary. Wow. Karen, thank you so much. This is really inspiring, especially also starting as a youth delegate uh, and the importance of uh, really working closely with the youth. So thank you very much. Muye, let's continue with you and hear from you a little bit about your background and also what kind of work you do now. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Mehmet. Uh, uh, as you said, I'm currently working for UNDP. Uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, the Regional Service Center, and I uh, started working for the UN uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, my uh, career in the field of environment and climate change started quite a long time ago. You know, when I was in university studying uh, agriculture and agricultural economics, I did my uh, undergraduate uh, final paper on uh, uh, environmental management and environmental degradation in uh, Zimbabwe which I carried through to my master's and PhD degrees in the economics of uh, 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 environmental management. And uh, in my work, you know, I've worked, I started off working with uh, NGOs in uh, Zimbabwe, a, a, a supporting farmers to uh, adapt to climate change through climate resilient crop varieties. And I also worked for the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Southern Africa, you know, supporting community-based natural resources management as well as uh, natural resource-based uh, enterprises. And then I moved on to uh, the International Institute for Environment and Development uh, at international level, uh, where I did uh, uh, work on uh, the economics of adaptation, uh, uh, through which I became a contributor, uh, actually uh, a lead author in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the fifth uh, assessment and in the fourth assessment rather. Uh, and that set the stage for me to move into NDP uh, uh, in 2012, uh, where I was posted in Botswana as uh, advisor on sustainable development goals uh, and sustainable development in general. And I spent six years there before moving to my current role, uh, supporting countries to develop and implement uh, climate change adaptation uh, programs and accessing uh, global climate change funds uh, from the Green Climate Fund, uh, the GEF, and so on, and uh, uh, blending uh, global environment finance with uh, government finance as well as uh, private sector finance. And by day-to-day -day work really involves, you know, uh, supporting countries to undertake adaptation. And at the country level, uh, the collaborative framework uh, amongst the UN agencies, which uh, which is captured in the uh, UN Assistance Framework or Sustainable Development Frameworks is the framework through which, uh, you know, I work with different agencies and also in different projects. Uh, we do quite a lot of collaborative work with UN agencies in the design and implementation of uh, uh, climate change uh, adaptation work uh, in developing countries. Uh, thank yeah. you and over to you, Mehmet. Wow, this is truly inspiration. We're also listening to you, how you're working with other UN agencies, joining efforts in this important field. Uh, let's move over to Doreen and learn more about her background and yeah, the role she's doing today. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm the newest um, comer. I only joined the UN three and a half years ago. But unlike Karen, I'm not going to tell you all when I was in secondary school because I don't want you to know. Um, but, you know, I early in life thought I was going to be a wildlife veterinarian. I studied natural, I studied animal science and natural resource management in my undergraduate degree. But um, what really intrigued me um, my whole life, and it's kind of the way I'm wired, is that I think the universe goes around because of systems and connections. And so I set out to explore how systems and connections can make an impact in the world. And when I was trying to understand that, um, what I realized is my love was absolutely in about working on environmental issues, not actually individual animals. So I switched my tack a little bit after a few years of work and um, decided to go uh, pursue a degree in conservation ecology 
and sustainable development, which is really, if you study ecology, it's all about systems and how things connect. So um, after, after studying I, a few years, I worked for big NGOs, small NGOs, globally, I um, sometimes in Latin America, all over the world, um, and decided that I wanted to really kind of look at different parts of the system. And I eventually um, joined the United States government. Um, working in different arms of the government, but uh, for most of it with the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I can say I've managed projects on every continent on the planet, except for Antarctica, um, but I will get there. And um, I did about 19 years, actually, with the federal government on and off. I worked for World Wildlife Fund in between. And really, um, it was everything from starting as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco to um, my last job was I wound up managing biodiversity, climate, water, energy, and food programs for 15 countries in Southern Africa. And um, I realized then, that was about three and a half years ago, that there was a part of the system that I didn't quite understand. And that was really, or I hadn't really engaged in, and that was this whole concept of multilater multilateralism. And I think if we all watch the news, we know how important it is. And so for me, it was really important to figure out if I could make a contribution to more collaboration and cooperation at a higher level to kind of get the world on the course I thought it should be going on. And so um, I joined a few years ago um, as the chief of wildlife, fantastic job. And then um, about a year ago, I was promoted to the head of biodiversity and land management, where I manage a team of about 70 people um, around the world, basically with the hardest but greatest job on the planet, um, UNEP, really our job is to set the global environment agenda. It's to promote the environmental dimensions of the sustainable development goals. But the really cool piece of what we do is that we also get to advocate on behalf of the environment, the thing that has no voice. And so that is um, what I'm doing now. Thanks. Wow, that really sounds pretty cool, Doreen, um, to advocate for the environment. And also, I like how you highlighted the word systems. And actually, my next question is about um, how to start your career in the UN system. So when we think back about the first start of your career in the UN system, um, Karen, would you like to take this question and share with us your experience and what was your motivation, let's say, to join the UN and perhaps also how you ended up applying, you know, for, for a UN position? Over to you. Sure. Thanks, Mamet. So as I mentioned, I participated in the UNFCCC process as a party delegate for the government of Barbados. And after a few years of representing and participating in various UN fora, I thought maybe the UN would be a good place to look for future career opportunities. So around 2005, the clean development mechanism was gaining momentum and the UNFCCC secretary had several vacancies. So I applied, it was shortlisted, it was interviewed, but I didn't get the job. I did get feedback, however, I was told that it wasn't that I wasn't good, but they felt it was better suited for other roles. So back to my usual national job. Then a few years later, I applied for another job again with the UNFCCC. And this one was supporting the executive secretary at the time. And again, it was shortlisted and interviewed, but again, I didn't get the job. However, this time I had been rostered. And a year later, I got a call asking if I'd be interested in joining the team to support the executive secretary in outreach efforts with the secretary general's team towards reaching agreement at this upcoming Copenhagen conference. And actually that temporary position that I was being offered was at a higher level than the one I had applied for the year before. Sometimes you just need to wait. <laughs> um, it sounded like an interesting assignment and I accepted an 11 month temporary appointment. Anyone following climate change will know that that conference did not go well, but my supervisor at the time was happy with my work and offered me an additional six month contract with the same team. Subsequently, he moved to another team and asked me to go with him. And that was when I moved out of the executive secretary's office to support the negotiations on the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. Still on a temporary contract, this assignment, although not one that I was initially super interested in, turned out to be what put me on the path to where I am now. That is where I got the experience supporting negotiating body. 
And then in 2013, so four years after I started, I got my first fixed term contract with a substantive team supporting the market mechanism negotiations. Again, also not where I thought I wanted to be, but again, this assignment provided me with the opportunity to learn new skills, acquire new knowledge. And then in 2015, a few months before the big Paris conference, I moved to the COP team as focal point to the COP. And that was a job that I was well suited for because of these previous assignments that I had done, which I at the time thought, mm, not my thing. So now seven years later, I got a promotion to team lead, still very closely involved in the COP team. Also now with responsibility for coordinating one of the other subsidiary bodies. And both of these are at the heart of the Secretariat's support to the climate negotiations. So the 11 month contract turned into a 13 year career with UNCCC. So far challenging, interesting, and with diverse and enriching experiences. So a lesson to those listening who are interested in joining the UN short term contracts can be the start of your career. Over to you, Wow, <laughs> that's such great advice, Karen. And also thank you for encouraging our talent here today. And you know what I love is your patience and your strong will. You haven't given up, right? And uh, and you also found your home and your niche. And and it's really great to listen to your passion and um, yeah, and also um, really going for it all the way. So thank you for sharing that. Just a quick note, I, I had a chance to have a glimpse. We have participants joining us from so many different countries today. Just to name a few, we have people from Zambia, Turkey, Namibia, Ghana, Nepal, Malawi, Jordan, Thailand, Kazakhstan, the US, Mauritania, Niger, Burundi, Burkina Faso, Swaziland, Burundi, Guay Guyana, Yemen, yes, and many, many more. So thank you everybody for joining us today. So my next question is about uh, how does your work in your current role relate to the Sustainable Development Goals. Muyeye, I'm looking at you. Would you like to take this question? Very much so. You know, this is uh, quite exciting. And uh, this is what makes my job really exciting. I work on climate change adaptation. Uh, and this involves so many sectors. Uh, you know, uh, we work on climate change adaptation in the water sector. Uh, I work on climate change adaptation in the coastal zone, uh, in the coastal zones, work on climate change adaptation in human settlements and in urban areas, work on climate change adaptation in uh, agriculture, uh, in livelihood improvement and so on. And uh, just by mentioning those areas, my work is touching on so many uh, SDGs, SDG 1, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, SDG 7, SDG uh, five and so on beyond. So starting off from SDG 13, you know, uh, almost all the SDGs are encountered in my work. And that is quite inspiring, given that the SDGs have got to be approached in an integrated manner. Thank you. Yeah, so important. I mean, thank you so much for talking through the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Muyeye. And, you know, also showing the bigger context of the work we're doing. And uh, it is really our roadmap, right? So when we look at the SDGs to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. So um, we still have a few minutes before we move to the Q&A session. Uh, and if you allow me, uh, I would also like to ask maybe a bit more of a personal question. And uh, one of the questions I have on mind is, um, what was the best moment of your entire career? So maybe we can do a quick round and hear from each of you. What was the best moment of your entire career so far? Who would like to go first? Muyeye, I think you unmuted yourself. You want to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, let me go ahead. You know, there is a community in, uh, in, in Liberia called uh, West Point Community. And I mm -hmm. work with uh, highly vulnerable communities in all my work in different countries. But when you go to West Point, uh, they're facing the, the, the sea and they, the, there is a vivid illustration of how they're vulnerable to climate change. And mm -hmm. I started going to 
Liberia developing uh, a project uh, with that community since 2018. And every time that I go to West Point, I see that the coastline has moved into the community by a meter or two and uh, a few houses have been uh, you know, uh, eroded and destroyed and so on. And um, we developed a project which was fairly complex because this is uh, you know, uh, uh, adaptation in the coastal zones. We approached the Green Climate Fund uh, for financing and it take, took quite a long time because the process is highly technical. Uh, it took some years and it was quite difficult to get funding from the Green Climate Fund until we agreed. And in March last year, the Green Climate Fund Board uh, approved the project to finance uh, the people of uh, West Point. And to me, that was a very emotional moment uh, in terms of seeing some of the global funds going to support the most vulnerable communities in the world. And I think that is going to stay with me for quite a while how we you know our work is useful to the uh most vulnerable people in the world thank you yeah yeah i can really sense the impact it had on you Muyeo, as you were describing the moment uh doreen let's hear from you um yeah what was the best moment uh of your entire career and maybe you want to contextualize it a little know, bit as well I, yeah i don't know about my entire career and you know but i do i was thinking when when you were talking, um, I had a moment very early on when I started where one of the things we were organizing, my team, was the first ever um, conference on wildlife economy in Africa. And wildlife economy is really focused on sustainable use and a truly sustainable use with equitable benefit sharing for people who live with nature. They bear the costs of nature, um, but it's about helping making sure that the benefits outweigh the cost as a means of driving incentives for conservation. So we hosted the first ever for Africa, recognizing how important this would be um, to, to really advance the agenda. And organizing the actual workshop was not the highlight um, because it was very complicated. We had 29 ministers, five sitting heads of state come. Uh, it was just a very complex thing to do, but there was a moment. Um, we had brought together uh, communities and indigenous people from around the continent and spent a day with them trying to help just facilitate what were their common messages and their voice. And we had a lot of members of um, the local communities that were quite young and were very, very nervous um, to speak up in front of this audience of ministers and presidents. And, so, and um, there was a moment during the conference when we had um, the sitting heads of state, all who had stayed on long before they uh, said they were gonna have to go. And we had a young woman of about 19, 20 years old, give up and give up, give comments about how she felt about nature. She was a volunteer in the community who was working on um, community patrols, trying to protect rhinos, elephants, and other species in Southern Africa. And she gave such a strong and pointed message and it was harsh and she was demanding accountability and protection and inclusivity and voice for communities. And she said it so eloquently and she was so impassioned and so young and she, the entire room stood up and gave her a round of applause. And they didn't even stand up for the presidents when they spoke. And that was the moment that I was super proud. We created that space for that message and that voice and that perspective to be heard at the highest levels of government. That was a pretty amazing experience. Wow, it sounds like a goosebump experience also as you talk through it, Doreen. Um, and it's really amazing how, how this really made a huge difference uh, in this context. So thank you for sharing that. Karen, uh, over to you. What do you have to share with us on your best moment? Um, there have been many, many highlights, but I think one yeah. that stands out particularly would be 2015, when I was part of the team that supported the French presidency that led parties to adopt the Paris Agreement, especially after having joined the sector in 2009 and being part of the anti-climatic negotiations in Copenhagen. So it was just indeed euphoric to be on the podium for the adoption of the Paris Agreement several years later. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal, but that will remain a special moment for now. 
Excellent, excellent. And also as you prepare for the next COP27. Wow, great. And um, I actually have another one and we can do like a quick round um, in just like maybe 30 seconds or 45 seconds. What is your biggest takeaway or advice for potential job candidates listening in right now? Um, yeah, if you could share with us like very quickly your takeaway or advice for potential job candidates right now. And uh, shall we start with you, Muyeye? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mehmet. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's always, uh, you know, uh, a struggle to find a job and uh, more so to find a job in the UN because there's so many people who are looking for jobs. But uh, one of the things that I really encourage uh, colleagues to do is to widen your uh, options and chances uh, by looking at different entry points, you know, into the UN, serving the UN through, you know, uh, uh, different uh, entry points. You can serve humanity uh, through different roles at different levels and different agencies and also in different uh, geographical areas. And the most important thing is to be willing to prepare yourself and to demonstrate your ability to apply your skills in these different contexts as you look for opportunities in the UN. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent advice, Muyeye. Uh, Doreen, can we continue with you for, yeah, what is your biggest takeaway and advice for potential job seekers? Yeah, so I think we often focus on the technical skills and degrees that are needed for a job, and those are essential. So I'm in a science-based policy institution. So of course, science and having that technical background to be able to take the evidence and turn it into policy is essential. But probably the most important skill set that I learned and invested in very early, and I encourage everyone to do it, is invest in communications. How do you communicate perspectives and opinions and points in effective ways with people who are coming from very different mindsets from you? If you can do that, it doesn't matter what your technical background is. That is a really important skill to have in the UN and frankly, anywhere. Excellent advice, especially on the comms. I think often this is really underestimated. So thanks for highlighting that, Doreen. Um, over to you, Karen. Um, maybe be strategic in your application. So apply to jobs that you have relevant experience and a skill set for, but most importantly, don't give up. You may not get your first or your second job, but keep trying at it. And sometimes short-term contracts, as has been my experience, can be the start of your career. And sometimes doing something not fully in line with what you thought was the path that you wanted could turn out to be a valuable experience that can become part of later, like, um, a set of your professional assets that you didn't think you would have had if you stayed on the path that you wanted to be. So be open. Be open. Great. Yeah, I really love that mindset. And uh, and as you said also earlier, right, it takes sometimes a few attempts as well and not be discouraged and really uh, connect to your strong will. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, panelists, for all your insights and um, yeah, and also your piece of advice for our candidates today who are joining us. And we can actually go now to the Q&A session. So this was the part of the panel discussion. And um, I, we have a few questions for you in the chat. So the first one is a question potentially for you, Karen, uh, and perhaps Doreen. What kind of opportunities do you see as essential to work further on in order to improve gender equality within climate change efforts, climate action, and, spe and specifically, uh, one second, specifically, is there anything more that can be done at the policy level and at the next COP meetings? If you could also provide examples, uh, that would be appreciated. So, yeah, over to you. Karen, you're smiling. <laughs> I'm trying to read the question again because we went kind of fast. It was a bit of a long one, right? It's a so long one. <laughs> the first part is what kind of opportunities do you see as essential to work further on in order to improve gender equality within climate change efforts, climate action? To be honest, I am not the gen I don't do gender in my in my uh, my life. Doreen seems to have some 
I knew she wants to pop up here. I'll pass on to Doreen first and then I'll come back. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I wanted to highlight two things. Well, one, um, what I think I'm really proud of is that the UN has a gender parity um, uh, goal and perspective and it's being applied. So it's also the UN is creating opportunities and in its own jobs and hiring to make sure that there is a balanced perspective, a balanced and diverse perspective. But I think when it comes to climate, look, it's a great question. It's we don't have the time to answer it. There is a long way to go. But I think what's really important first is how we do consultations, who gets involved in climate decision making, how do we make sure those perspectives are at the table, and that we create those platforms and voice. And we do it, we don't just assume that gender and diverse perspectives are going to show up, but we purposely seek them out. So I think it's a very purposeful action that has to be woven into not just the climate cop, all of the multilateral negotiations. And I think there's also a one thing we can do is also, you know, member states, when they set up their delegations and their participants, it's something that they too very much have to think about, um, is who they bring to these agendas and who they bring to the table and creating that space for those diverse perspectives in a purposeful way is really important. Thank you so much. Do you yeah, want to do, add? Yeah. Yeah, we do have that in the climate change process in terms of encouraging female delegates to come. When we do our application processes, we encourage female applicants to apply there's an actual, there's a full gender work program. So if the person who wrote the question can drop me a message, me, I can put them in touch with our, our gender focal point who can go on ad nauseum <laughs> on the opportunities in terms of excellent. gender. Excellent, excellent, Karen. Thank you so much for that offer. And it's such an important topic and also bringing everybody together at the table and, and really influencing the agenda here. Um, I have another question here coming from the audience, which is, I am finishing a PhD in bioinformatics, and I really would love to find an opportunity to make the difference in the world. That's why I started to look for opportunities in the UN. I created my profile on Inspira, but I couldn't find any particular position that really fits my profile. And I feel a little bit lost. Do you have a suggestion about a particular agency group where I should look for opportunities? So this person has a PhD in bioinformatics. Do you have any piece of advice for, for this person? Well, can I come in, Mehmet? Yes, of course. Over to you. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, Doreen mentioned earlier on that you know sometimes we focus very much on you know our qualifications. It's about the applications of those qualifications, and uh, you know the different UN agencies base mm. their work a lot on science and data, and I think that field is very much relevant to that. And it's more now about how one positions themselves to contribute, and it may not be in uh, the same position that uh, Doreen or Karen or myself have got. It could be uh, uh, as a starting point, as part of a, a technical team, and uh, we talked about the entry points. You may not necessarily start, you know, as a full-time staffer, but probably as part of, uh, you know, a consulting team and so on. It's about finding that relevant space where you, you know, you can contribute that expertise uh, in a science-based, uh, in science-based organizations, it doesn't matter which agency uh, it is. It's all it's relevant. Bioinformatics is relevant to all organizations, really. And making, you know, bringing the innovation into the UN is quite, uh, quite important. Thank you. Yeah, great advice, Muyeye. I don't know if anybody wants to add, but I would really also highlight what you just said. I mean, first of all, it's great that you did the first step to create your profile and look for opportunities. And, uh, and as Mouye said, you know, uh, really explore opportunities, look what is out there and also look at sort of like different, I mean, there's a broad skill set needed for different roles and see, um, what are related fields as well when we talk about bioinformatics, uh, what you can qualify for, what type of roles, consultancies, short term opportunities. Um, and we will be sharing, as I said in the beginning, also a handout with different career portals. So maybe that will be also helpful for you to explore further and see because there are a lot of job openings at the moment as well, especially in these areas. Um, 
Another question I have here is, how did your job change during the pandemic? And maybe this is a, this is a really interesting one because, um, yeah, because we're now going into hybrid. I mean, from total working at home, going into hybrid. What is your experience with that? And what would you like to share um, yeah, with our audience today? Yes, Doreen, I think you're yeah raising your hand over to yeah. you. Yeah, so right, we all went and are still going through the pandemic. Um, and uh, I think the hardest part for me was trying to maintain work-life balance um, because, you know, we had the fact that we were on duty all the time um, and you could call and, you know, there was amazing things about technology we hadn't explored before that uh, made it made us have more access and ability to communicate, but it also became harder when we were working from home to kind of make sure that I kept that work-life balance to refill my well and make sure I didn't burn out. I think the, the other piece is I'm an extrovert by nature um, and technology even on a screen wasn't quite enough. So I miss that uh, very much. And I think I'm happy to be going back to work, but a real positive from the pandemic is for me, um, is that we learned we don't have to emit so much carbon flying around the world to have the conversations that we need to have. And I hope that sticks with us, that we can get better, more effective and more efficient and kind of limit uh, travel uh, to the things that we absolutely need to do together. I think that's actually one positive that came out of it. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Doreen. Um, and I can see also that it resonates with our panelists as you were sharing your experience. Yeah, so um, picking up for what you said about not having to fly, maybe we had to actually do a lot of our events and our meetings online. One yeah. of the hardest parts was trying to fit all of the time zones into suitable periods. So we yeah. had to end up doing sessions in like two parts and invariably somebody was up at 2 or 4 a.m. <laughs> but that, that was one of the most challenging parts, trying to fit into people's personal lives, but still have meetings at times that made sense, which is not possible. So we were all inconvenienced. Yeah, thanks so much, Karen. So I have one last question here, uh, which is um, around one, or oh, actually more questions are coming in, but uh, as we're closing very soon, I just wanna, um, um, okay, so I see here one, United Nations job description emphasizes so much on work experience, most times even above three years or more. Can the panelists throw more light on this? It's around the job description and the work experience that is needed. And often it's above three years or more. Yeah. Who would like to? Yeah, Doreen, over to you. No, I would just say, you know, the, the work experience is necessary in terms of the ability to perform the duties, but I would really encourage folks who are interested, if you don't have that full work experience, there's other ways. Um, I think others talk about it. there's the UN volunteers, there's different, you can get consultancy jobs or short-term things. We'd hire independent contractors sometimes at more junior levels as a way to build that up within the system so that you can meet those minimum requirements. Um, so I would, again, I'm going back to something everybody else said, mm. look around, be flexible because there's many, many ways in. It's not just always the full-time job. Yeah. And I agree with that also from an HR perspective. I mean, we listened to Karen as well in the beginning, how she described from a temporary role, how she made it to a more permanent role in the UN. There are different openings uh, and different requirements for openings. We have also openings where there is only two years of work experience needed, or maybe perhaps one year. There are internships, there are consultancies, there are different roles within the UN family, also the UN volunteers, where there are different uh, requirements and uh, yeah please explore those opportunities and we have also the young professional program where for example no years of experience are needed so there is a whole range uh, and um, I hope you can uh, explore all of these opportunities as part of a follow-up to this discussion today um, and I am now looking at the time. Uh, yeah, we are actually uh, at 45 minutes. And I'm looking at the panel. 
please feel free if there is one last comment or piece of advice you would like to share a very very quick one because we're at the end of the 45 minutes let's do a quick round uh, what you would like to say to the audience today uh, one piece of advice or some recommendation can we start with you uh, Karen Working with the UN is a, definitely a gratifying experience and there are different paths to get here. So as far as the others were saying, as far as other opportunities, go through your national governments, get involved in NGOs. You may not make it here immediately, but it can be a path to get here. Excellent. Thank you so much. Muyeye. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, again, you know, working for the UN is uh, quite a big privilege because we are influencing people's lives. And, uh, mm. you know, but there's quite a lot of work to be done and a lot of colleagues spend, you know, uh, a lot of time. And therefore, I, I always uh, think that when you want to come to the UN, you really have got to develop that passion. And I think every one of us has got that passion. And I think it's a good driver and motivator to keep on uh, looking for these opportunities, even when it is difficult. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's my point. Now more than ever in the world, I truly believe that multilateralism is needed. And uh, the UN is the premier institution to do that in. There are passionate people. Um, there may be some myths out there about bureaucrats or paper pushers, but I know I'm surrounded by passionate people who want to make a difference on the planet. So I think um, it is a very gratifying place to go. Wow, thank you very much for your uh, advice. And um, yeah, I would like to thank you. It was really an inspiring conversation to have with you. And thanks for sharing your yeah, background and expertise and also um, yeah, your career path within the UN. And I also want to say thank you to all the colleagues in the background. There are many colleagues who are collecting the questions and helping us to uh, address them today. And um, there will be more events in the future, so please stay connected. And we would like to also point out that uh, we have a lot of many, a lot of different opportunities and programs that can be found on the career portals. And uh, each organization has their own pages uh, and you can search for different roles and opportunities. You can also tailor them based on your interest and expertise. And please also follow us on the social media channels. Uh, some of you already do that. And um, yeah, thank you really today for participating to make a difference for our planet, for such an important topic. And of course, for your interest in uh, yeah, joining the UN family and for all the great questions you have uh, shared today with us. Thank you very much to everyone and to our panelists today. Listen up, people. You're headed for a climate disaster. And yet every year, governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you.